Today, as the title suggests, we're taking a dive into three different cameras. I've owned the a7 III since it came out two years ago. I recently picked up the Fuji X-T3 in the Canon EOS R, so I could start doing some comparisons between the three. By the time of you watching this video, I'll have owned all these cameras close to four or five weeks, so I've had a good chance to play around with them. Some might say four or five weeks really isn't enough to get to know these cameras, learn their ins and outs. And I would somewhat agree with you, but I'd also say this video is more of a long-term Sony user trying out these cameras for about a month. Or if you're thinking of swapping from Sony to one of these cameras, this will be a good video for you too. The US R is a great comparison directly to the a7 III because they're both full frame cameras. They're both roughly around the same cost. The X-T3 is more a camera I wanted to pick up because everybody raves about it. And honestly, I wanted to try out and see what the fuss is about. Before we jump right in, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is the sponsor of today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning, with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Start 2020 off the right way, learn new skills, deepen some passions. You've all got passions, I've got passions, let's learn more about them using Skillshare's online classes. Brandon Woeful, you know who he is, right? Peter McKinnon did a whole video covering him. He's got a course on Skillshare, Instagram worthy photography, shoot, edit and share with Brandon Woeful. He covers a lot of stuff in the studio and on location too. So it's definitely a course you should check out. The other nice thing on Skillshare is they also curate lists for you too. So look at this one, best of film and video. They've got video editing, DIY cinematography, iPhone videography, advanced aerial videography, pretty much everything you can think of, Skillshare has it covered. Skillshare offers classes designed for actual real life. So you know how life's busy, right? I'm busy all the time. So are you, but if you get an hour free, you can just jump on and learn at your own pace. You can learn with shorter classes that fit your busy routine. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable too, especially compared to in-person classes and workshops, that kind of thing. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. If you click the link down below, you will get a special offer, two months of free premium membership to explore your creativity and pretty much learn anything you wanna learn. Any of their classes, they're all included with their two months free. Today I'm not going to be talking too much about video quality, about image quality, because honestly that's been done by everybody and their dog on YouTube already. I want to give you more a real hands-on experience, little things that I found, things I like, things that I don't like, little nuances. Think of these as things you don't really hear too much about, but you're very likely to encounter when using all of these cameras. And yes, I fully expect the comment section to be rife with hatred towards me today. It's quite a controversial topic to talk about different camera brands, especially in the same video, directly comparing them. But honestly, these are all things that I've encountered, you're likely to encounter, so it's good for you to know about. So let's try and keep it clean down below, keep it constructive. If you wanna have a conversation about something, just don't be a dick. So I have split this into different sections to make it a little bit easier to follow. Within each section, I'll talk individually about each camera. Let's get this going with a bang. Everybody knows I'm a long-term Sony user, but the Canon EOS R is the easiest to use, the simplest to use, picking up straight out of the box, hands down by far. And honestly, I kind of think that's why everyone's picking this camera up now. It's very simple, it's very straightforward to use. At its price, it's quite appealing. If you just wanna make quick, easy YouTube videos, take some photos, this is probably gonna be a good option for you. The menu system is very straightforward, very easy to use. It's all touchscreen, much like an iPhone is. You just tap on what it is you wanna change and you can change it. You don't have to scroll through eight different menus to get to whatever it is you wanna change. Just tap it and it's ready to change for you. That being said, one big annoyance I had with the USR is if you wanna change from photo to video mode quickly, there isn't a way to do it. It's literally minimum of three buttons to push it. You have to push mode, info, and then set to change from photo to video mode. Let's say for example, you are taking a photo and you wanna record a video. You can just quickly record a video, but only using one specific set of settings, which you assign to C3. If you, were, let's say have C3 assigned to 1080, but you wanna shoot 4K and you're currently in photo mode, you have to go mode, info, set, change to 4K, then take your video, but now you wanna go back to photo, you've gotta go mode, info, set, back to photo. That doesn't make sense to me. There must be an easy way to do it, and I'm sure in the future we will see that. Being a long-term Sony user, this is obviously my old faithful. I know this in and out. It's very easy to use, but if you were new to all of these three cameras, I'd say this one's kind of in the middle. It's definitely more overwhelming than the EOS R is. The menu systems are a little bit more complicated. Obviously not being touchscreen, you have to scroll through them and things are sometimes buried quite deep. But once you get used to it, you pretty much know where most things are. The Fuji, on the other hand, is at the tail end of this. I would say this is the least easy pick up and use friendly camera, to be honest with you. The menu system is deeper than David Barry's Labyrinth. It's not fun to use to find things that you need to find. And also, 
Tell me this, if you're a Fuji user, maybe there isn't a way. If you go and set a setting, and then you wanna just check that setting, push the shutter to go back to test the setting out, and now you wanna go back and change that setting again, it doesn't take you back to the same menu system you were just in. You have to go back through the menus to find that same menu system. Why is that a thing? It shouldn't be that hard to change a setting, test it out, and then go back and change it again. If there's an easier way, please comment down below because I'd love to know, but in what I can tell, there isn't. I will say the more you use it, it does become easier to use, much like any camera would. With experience, you're obviously gonna get better, but it's still a lot more complicated. And even now and then I have to think about things before going and changing them. Whereas with the USR and the uh, A7 III, I can just kind of do it now with muscle memory. I'm still not at muscle memory level with this. The grip of a camera is a really big deal. Sometimes it's something that's often overlooked. And the reason the grip is so important is because you're holding this camera all the time to take any video, any photo, any content you're making with this camera, you're physically holding it. So the grip to me is really important. When you pick up the cameras for the first time, it's literally the first thing that you think of. In terms of mirrorless cameras that I've used, and I've used quite a lot of different ones, maybe I don't own them all, but I've used a lot, the USR has the best grip of all, bar none. It's really deep, who doesn't like it deep? which makes it really easy to hold and it just feels safe in the hand. It doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It just feels natural in the hand and it feels like how a camera should really hold. I'm not saying the a7 III, which I've been using for a long time is bad, but I'm saying that this feels better. Picking up both cameras and holding them both in the hand, you can feel comparatively in each hand, this one feels like it's more secure than this one is. Fuji, on the other hand, does not feel natural in any way. Now I've actually got a grip extender on here right now and even with that, it it doesn't kind of go deep. It gives you a lot to hold, but it just feels like it's ready to fall out of my hand at any time. It's by far the least most natural grip of all these cameras, and I don't enjoy holding this camera. It just doesn't feel safe in my hands. Even with the grip extension on here, it just doesn't feel great. If you take the grip extension off, it may as well just be a flat camera. It doesn't really have any form of a grip that you can hold and it's not very comfortable. Something to think about quickly, I don't see anyone else talking about this. The a7 III is what I believe is the only true one-handed camera. And what I mean by this is if the camera is off and you need to turn it on and take a picture and this hand is occupied by a monopod, a tripod, a bag, I don't know, it happens all the time where I'm using this hand for something else, if I'm out shooting, I can turn this camera on and control all my settings on the right here. I've got my aperture, my shutter speed and my ISO all within reach. I can turn the camera off. I can do all that with one hand. With the EOS R, the on and off switch is on the left, so instantly not possible. And then with the X-T3, I have a dial on the left here, which is to control settings too. So I don't believe any of these cameras other than the a7 III is actually a true one-handed job. Something to just think about. Let's talk about screens. Something that I really think is important in a camera because we use a screen for a lot of different things. You're often using a screen just to look at if you're not looking through the EVF to play back your images. A screen is important. Using the EOS R is the nicest of all the three in terms of experience. It has the most resolution at 2.1 million dots. You can instantly tell if something is sharp, something is in focus just by quickly glancing at the screen or if you're looking back at an image afterwards, you can tell what is in focus. Exposure reads properly as in you can trust the EVF to look the same as the screen. If you're a long time subscriber to this channel, you'll know I do have some issues with the a7 III screen. It's not the clearest and it doesn't read exposure properly. Yes, as I always say, I know you can trust histograms and you should use histograms and I do. But what I'm saying is the screen should still function how it should function. It should work properly. When you're looking through the EVF and you're looking at the screen, it should be the same image. On the a7 III, it is not. On the EOS R, it is. The Fuji screen is much like the EOS R, not quite as high resolution. I believe it's just over 1 million dots, but it is noticeable using it, comparing it to the, uh, the a7 III. Also the exposure on the Fuji, comparing the EVF and the screen, they both read out the same, which obviously is a good thing. In terms of screen, I'd say the Sony is definitely the loser here. I really hope in any future Sony models, they just put a higher quality screen in there and uh, I'll be really happy with that. Let's quickly talk about flip screens. I'm not gonna cover it hugely. Yes, the USR does have a flip screen which goes out that way. So if you wanna vlog, you can. Do I use this flip screen as much as I thought I would? Honestly, not really. I'll tell you the one big thing that I do use it for, if I'm shooting any photos or videos and I'm going handheld, it's actually quite nice to just rest the screen on my wrist like that. It just seems to give me a little bit more stability. It's another point of contact. I don't know if that's good or bad for it, but 
I like using it that way. It works quite well for me. I will say that a flip screen that comes out this way compared to the A6400, which I'm showing on right now and the screen flips up, I much prefer the screen flipping out this way. It's just more convenient. It has more use. The X-T3 screen obviously flips the same way as the Sony, but it also gives you a vertical flip. So if you need to shoot any portraits like that, you can, and that's actually more useful than I thought it would be. So even if Sony for some reason doesn't put in a flip screen, I really hope they do. Uh, but having a, a vertical flip in like that is actually quite a useful thing, especially for portraits and low angle shots that are portrait, which is pretty much every shot that anyone takes now, because if you're going on Instagram, you got to shoot in portrait. I kind of think, and some people will disagree with me on this, I'm sure, but if Sony was to put a fully articulating screen into a camera like the a7 IV, whenever it comes out, I think that would have more of an impact on how well that camera does, how much it sells, comparatively to anything else that they put in that camera. My personal opinion, but I think it would be a big deal. Let's talk about focusing and focusing points. Typically on cameras, you have a joystick and you use that to control your focusing points. That's something I've never really been a fan of doing. On the USR, however, you have a screen which you can drag your thumb or this thumb or a finger, but let's say you're holding up to your eye here, you use your thumb to control your focus points or this thumb to control your focus points. And it's so natural and it works incredibly well. And I've, as I said, I've never used the joystick properly before, but this, is an incredible feature and I really, really love it. It's just as responsive as say touching an iPhone screen and the whole EOS touchscreen is like that. And it just works really well. Now the Fuji does allow you to do this as well. However, it's a lot less responsive. It's kind of clunky and a lot slower. That being said, it does also have the joystick on there too. So if you want to just use the joystick, you have that there as an option. The a7 III is a little bit of a different experience. And the way I shoot uh, for photos, uh, I depress the shutter button to get what I want in focus. Obviously you don't have the focus points with the drag to thumb. You do have the joystick there if you want to use that, but I don't like using it. So I have to press the shutter and honestly, most of the time, first go, it gets what I want in focus. I don't know how it does that. It reads my mind or something. If it doesn't, for whatever reason, get it the first go, by the second go, it's got it. I then use my AF on button as my focus hold. I hold it to get my focus to stay exactly how it is and then I recompose my shot to get the composition exactly how I want it. I take the shot and I'm good. Wasn't able to replicate that experience with the USR or the X-T3. Didn't work anywhere near as good. So I think that kind of talks about how good the autofocus system is in this and how much AI it uses and that kind of thing. If you like to shoot that way or if you even back button focus, you're probably gonna find the same thing. You will prefer the, uh, the focus and experience for photos with the a7 III. Continuing with focus, let's talk about IAF. When this was delivered from B&H, it had the old version of the firmware on it, which didn't have the IAF update, and it was terrible, just awful. It did not work in any way. I then updated it, and it was a lot better. That being said, the IAF on the Sony is still night and day difference. This works a lot better, a lot more consistently, let's put it that way, and a lot further away than the USR does. I would actually say that the X-T3 is probably on par with the USR, maybe a little bit better, but in terms of IAF, if you're gonna be using that a lot and you want the best camera for IAF, hands down still the Sony a7 III or any newer Sony a6400, 6100, 6600, any newer Sony is gonna have really great IAF. All right, autofocus, we have to touch on it quickly. This will be the biggest conversation down below, I'm sure. Uh, a lot of people say the EOS R is the best, their dual pixel autofocus is the best. I think we have to determine and get a grasp on what best means. I think the Sony a7 III is the fastest. I think the EOS R looks the most natural in that it's not as quick as the a7 III, but it looks more natural. It looks like someone's pulling focus. And then the X-T3 is not as quick as the a7 III. It's probably as quick, maybe a little bit quicker than the USR, but it doesn't look as natural as the USR. So it's somewhere in the middle there. That's the end of the autofocus debate for me. That's how I feel. On to the next subject. Okay, colors. I haven't written any notes down on this one because I want to kind of go off the cuff. And if I ramble a bit, I'm sorry, but this is kind of how I feel. Everybody says the USR has the best colors out there, specifically the skin tones. If you compare the a7 III and the USR next to each other, yes, there is a difference. Is it that one's better than the other? No, I think it's personal preference. I think yes, there's a difference, but I think it's all down to taste. It's like looking at a piece of art and saying why you like it and someone else saying why they don't like it. That's pretty much how it is. If you like one, great. If you like the other, great. I'm not gonna judge you. The Fuji, on the other hand, Fuji is very well known for its film simulations. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to pick up the Fuji X-T3. 
great camera for video. It's got all the film simulations in it. Great for photos too. I'm trying to think how to word this without insulting people. I love the idea of this and I love the idea of Fuji. Having used it in practice, I shoot everything in RAW because I like that ability to edit in post. Fuji's film simulations are nice. They're not as nice as I thought they would be. I'm not as wowed by them as I thought I would be. With both the EOS R and the A7 III, I can edit the images, at least for photo, exactly how I want them to look in Lightroom. The X-T3, you kind of got to use Capture One to get the best results from in terms of both image quality and for colors. And my workflow does not involve Capture One. I've tried it out, I don't like it. I'm Adobe for Lightroom and Lightroom Mobile, and honestly, I'm probably gonna stick that way for the inevitable future. I don't see a reason to change. I really like that system. And because I don't love the Fuji film simulations, why would I shoot RAW for Fuji? Even straight out the camera, I'm not wowed by the, uh, the RAW images, which some people are. I was watching a video the other day on someone saying how they just love how even the Fuji RAW images look for skin tones direct from the camera. And honestly, I'm not that impressed. I would say straight from the camera, the Canon and the uh, Sony look great for skin tones from a raw image, and then you can change it a little bit. So for me, I'm not as wowed by the Fuji's colors as everyone else, or at least some people talk about. And I'll leave it at that, I've probably rambled, but that's what I think in terms of colors. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and that's kind of what I think. Well, actually, let's go back to Capture One quickly, and people are gonna say, you don't have to use Capture One. Yes, you can use Lightroom, agreed. But if you go and look at a lot of videos, and if you do comparisons yourself, you will notice that the colors are better in Capture One, and you'll notice that the, even like the resolution of the images, the sharpness of certain images, it just looks nicer in Capture One. I don't know if it's more natural, it just looks nicer. It's hard to sometimes describe what it is, but if you compare them side by side, you'll always go, yeah, Capture One. And I don't wanna use Capture One. I don't wanna change my workflow just for a camera. If you want to do that, great, good for you, but it's not for me. Okay, a few random ones to throw in here, just shorter ones to talk about. Software. In terms of using the cameras, the X-T3, the EOS R, and the A7 III. The EOS R and the X-T3 are quick to turn on. You turn them on and they're pretty much instantaneously ready to go. The A7 III isn't, there's a little bit of lag. Second, half a second, but whatever. It takes time to be able to get going with your photo or your video compared to the X-T3 and the OSR, and it's noticeable. Using all three, it's definitely noticeable. Same with the software, using them in the menus. Buttons have a microsecond of a delay compared to using the OSR and the X-T3, and using all three cameras is noticeable. If you never used them, you probably wouldn't notice it. But I also have the A6400 shooting on it right now, and it's the same thing for that. So it must just be Sony software. Is it bad? No. Is it noticeable? Yes. Something that annoys me with the Sony is these flaps. They flap around. They don't really serve much of a purpose when they're loose like that. So I'd like to see a better implementation of those in the future. On the USR, they are slightly different and they're firmer and they don't really flap around. This one here is more like it just kind of goes back to itself. And even this one here just goes back to itself. So even if you've got something plugged in there, it's not really wiggling around anywhere. Like the Sony, if it's plugged in, it's still loose and flapping around. That's frustrating. And then on the X-T3, it's by far the best implementation of all of them. It's a flap that stays up and it doesn't rattle. Well, it goes back down because I've got nothing plugged in right now. But it's either open or closed. There is no flappy in the middle. So X-T3 has the best version of all the flaps. I'm talking about flaps, aren't I? Here's one you probably don't think about too much. When you plug in your memory card with the A7 III and you want to download your photos and your videos, they're in separate folders and then they're in folders within those folders and then they're in folders within those folders before you even get to your images and your videos. And when you do that over and over and over again, sometimes multiple times a day, at least multiple times a week, it becomes frustrating to have to do that and click it all those times. With the USR and the X-T3, you don't. Everything, both photo and video is boom, one folder ready to go. And I like that. So be aware of that. Can't go one video talking about the ESR without talking about its crop. Yes, it's pretty bad. It's pretty much like shooting with an APS-C sensor on a full frame body when you want to shoot in 4K. It's stupid. Let's just leave it at that. Hopefully in any future iterations, they don't have that ridiculous 
cripple hammer of a crop. The Fuji has the best in terms of frame rates available to you. It has 4K60 there if you want to use it. It has a little tiny crop on it, not too bad though. It's still usable. It's no Canon cripple hammer crop, but it's got a little crop. Um, that being said, it's not that important to me. I don't really need 4K60 for anything. The 1080 on the Canon USR is really nice. It's it's a very, very usable format. Uh, I don't really use 1080 on, at least for these videos, on the a7 III that much. I use it still for client work, but for YouTube videos, I try and shoot all in 4K, like this video right now, a6400 4K. You could probably get due with shooting EOS R 1080, and a lot of people upscale to 4K, and it still looks really crispy, really clean, and I've tried it out, and I'm happy with it, so it's something to be aware of. The Fuji and the Canon also have much higher bit rates for recording video. Depending on how you shoot and if you wanna go in higher bit rates and have more push and pull in post for colors and that kind of thing, you have more play with the X-T3 and the USR than the a7 III does. X-T3 and a7 III both have dual card slots. Obviously the USR, as you probably know, only has the one. Does that impede your ability to use this for professional work? I don't know, depends how trustworthy you are of this camera. You can go online and really, I haven't seen anybody that's had many issues with this and only being one card slot. So it depends how much you trust this. If you need a backup of a backup, then you're probably not gonna wanna use this and you're not gonna be able to trust it. Something to be aware of. One thing I really like on the USI is you can go back after you've shot an image and view the focus point. So if you're not too sure where you were exactly focusing, where your thumb landed for the autofocus point or wherever the autofocus point was on whoever's eye or whatever, you can view that after the fact. And I really like that. I haven't found the ability to do that in the A7 III. Uh, in the X-T3, I haven't actually tested that. Probably should have done that before I recorded this video, but I like being able to do that on the USR. Something I like about the USR, dust cover on there. I haven't really had that many issues with the a7 III and getting dust on it. X-T3 also doesn't have a dust sensor on there. Dust does get on it now and then. It's pretty easy to clean off just with a blower or if you have to, you can use a sensor swab. But you're likely to not have any of those issues with the USR because there's obviously a cover. a7 III and X-T3 are way better at changing modes. You have dials to be able to change your modes. On the same on this, you have a dial to be able to change your mode. On the USR, you don't. You have a mode button and then you have to click through the modes. So I don't like that. The, let's put these down. These two are way better for quickly changing modes. And then dynamic range. The a7 III is better in terms of dynamic range than the USR. You can rescue more from the shadows with the a7 III than you can with the USR, which I'm really guilty of doing. I often underexpose, sometimes purposely, but if you want to bring that back up, you can't do as much with the USR before you get noise. A7 III, you can go further. X-T3 isn't really as good. It's an APS-C camera, so it performs pretty much how I thought it would. You can still rescue stuff, just not as much as you can with the USR, and then with that, you can't rescue as much as you could with the A7 III. So there we go. That is how I feel about the X-T3 versus the A7 III versus the USR for the less common things that are talked about, things that you will find with these cameras when you use them. So if you're thinking of swapping from Sony to the USR, or if you're thinking from going from Fuji to Canon or something like that. Things you should be aware of, things you will find when you pick up these cameras coming from a different camera system or using one of these camera systems for the first time. So hopefully you got something from this video. If you have something to say and you hate what it is that I talked about, just keep it constructive. There's no reason to be that guy down below. If you put something that bad, I'll probably pin it to the top and let everybody go nuts on you. I'll do that. All right. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.